This is a mechanism of disease map for ectopic pregnancy. I'll be talking about the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of ectopic pregnancy. Each of these boxes is color-coded according to this legend in the top right, and I'll be clearing all the boxes and repopulating the flowchart one by one as we talk about each concept. Let's go ahead and get started. We'll start with the definition of ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy in which the fertilized egg attaches outside the uterine endometrium. So a normal pregnancy is when the egg attaches, it implants into the endometrium of the uterus. An ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy in which the egg ends up outside the endometrium. So it's in the wrong place. It's at a different site. Where is it? It could be in many different places. It's most commonly by far in the fallopian tube. 95% of ectopic pregnancies end up in the fallopian tube. And we can break this down to the parts of the fallopian tube. For instance, the ampulla makes up 70%, the isthmus makes up 15%, the fimbriae is 8%, and the corneal is 2%. Outside of the fallopian tube, you can have an ectopic pregnancy in the ovary, that's 3% of cases. In the abdomen, like in the peritoneal space, that's 1% of cases. And less than 1% of cases makes up ectopic pregnancies in the cervix. So many places that they can be. Now let's work our way back and talk about the etiology and the pathophysiology of ectopic pregnancies. The majority of cases occur due to anatomic alteration of the fallopian tubes. And that usually involves inflammation. Now inflammation causes anatomic alteration by damaging the fallopian tubes. So this happens in a couple ways. First of all, inflammation disrupts the smooth muscle contractions and the ciliary beat of the fallopian tubes. This is the fallopian tubes' normal function. They have smooth muscle contraction, uh, contraction and ciliary beats that push the embryo or the oocytes through the tubes from the ovary into the, into the uterus. And when you're disrupting this normal movement, when you're disrupting this coordinated motion, that can kind of have your embryo or your oocyte stall in the fallopian tubes and prevent them from getting to where they need to be. And that, that by itself causes ectopic pregnancy. In addition, inflammation damages the fallopian tubes and causes upregulation of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And those pro-inflammatory cytokines actually promote implantation of the embryo, invasion of the embryo into the surrounding space, and angiogenesis. So the pro-inflammatory cytokines also play a role in causing the embryo to implant in the wrong site. So not only are you disrupting the normal um, function of the fallopian tubes, but you're also promoting embryo implantation prematurely. Now, what exactly causes the damage in the fallopian tubes? What causes the inflammation? There are several things. Previous ectopic pregnancies can, of course, be very inflammatory, especially if they cause a tubal rupture. That can cause inflammation. Fallopian tube surgeries, such as tubectomies, can be very inflammatory. Endometriosis, this is a process where you have endometrial tissue outside of the uterus. That can be inflammatory and also cause anatomic changes um, in the reproductive tract. A ruptured appendix, of course, can cause this. Smoking is a very inflammatory process, has been shown to predispose you to ectopic pregnancies. Exposures to DES, uh, this is a uh, medicine that they used to use, and they would give it to mothers, and if baby was exposed to it in utero, it could affect the development of their um, genital urinary tract. I think it, it could essentially affect your uh, fallopian tubes, and that could predispose you to ectopic pregnancies 20 plus years later when the when that baby decides to have their own babies. A bicoordinate uterus can cause inflammation. This could also just be a structural deficit without the inflammation. And lastly, and this might be one of the more common causes, pelvic inflammatory disease. Usually an infectious process like salpingitis can, uh, of course, damage the fallopian tubes as well. There are other causes of, or the other predisposing factors for ectopic pregnancy. One of the more common ones is advanced maternal age. That's defined as moms that are at least 35 years old when becoming pregnant. There are also less common causes. This is like Cartagener syndrome. This is also known as ciliary dyskinesia. And the problem here is that the ciliary, uh, the, the little hair-like cells that beat within the tubules don't form properly. So you kind of have a structural deficit that leads to ectopic pregnancies. Some other, I guess, more common causes include intrauterine devices for birth control, as well as in vitro fertilization. Any kind of manipulation of the uterus or the fallopian tubes can predispose you to ectopic pregnancies. 
One last one here, another iatrogenic cause. Hormone therapy can cause hormone dysregulation, and hormone dysregulation is thought to slow the transport of fertilized eggs. If the transport of the eggs is slowed down, they're more likely to implant in the fallopian tube. They spend more time in the fallopian tube, so that can also predispose you to ectopic pregnancies. Now let's work our way to the manifestations. The manifestations of ectopic pregnancy typically happen around four to six weeks after the last menstrual period. And these are the more common symptoms, the more striking symptoms for ectopic pregnancy first. Patient can have lower abdominal pain and guarding. It's important to differentiate this from appendicitis because sometimes they do present the same, um, kind of medium, kind of acute onset, uh, lower abdominal pain and guarding. Um, can be both appendicitis and ectopic pregnancy. They might have vaginal bleeding. And this is sometimes actually mistaken for just normal menstruation. That menstruation is, I guess, delayed if it's been four to six weeks since the last menstrual period, but um, you can have bleeding with ectopic pregnancy depending on the site of the pregnancy. Patients can have tenderness in the ectopic area. For instance, if it's in the fallopian tubes or if it's in the ovary, it could kind of be an adnexal tenderness on your pelvic exam. Patients can have cervical motion tenderness. Now, normally when we think of cervical motion tenderness, we think of PID, pelvic inflammatory disease. In this case of ectopic pregnancy, patients can have cervical motion tenderness with a closed cervix. So that's kind of how you rule out uh, pelvic inflammatory disease. In pelvic inflammatory disease, you might have an open cervix, and there might actually be pus or fluid or discharge coming from that cervix. In ectopic pregnancy, you can have cervical motion tenderness with a closed cervix. Enlarged uterus is another finding that you might notice on pelvic exam as well. And of course, because these patients are pregnant, they do have high beta HCG and they do have those normal signs and symptoms of pregnancy. So those will be here as well. So they'll have amenorrhea. Of course, they haven't had a menstrual period in a while. That's how they found out they were pregnant. Uh, they can have nausea, they can have breast tenderness, and they can have frequent urination as well. So those normal signs and symptoms of pregnancy are still fair game for ectopic pregnancy. Now, one of the more dreaded complications of ectopic pregnancy is tubal rupture. And we'll talk about the additional symptoms that this can cause, as well as um, how you want to, and, 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 and as, as well as kind of the complications of the complication, which we'll see ends up being hemorrhagic shock. So firstly, tubal rupture causes a severe lower abdominal pain, and this pain is going to be pretty distinct from the uh, pain that the patient had before the tubal rupture. This is usually a more acute course, a sudden worsening of the abdominal pain. In addition, when you have tubal rupture, it's possible that the patient bleeds into their abdominal cavity, and bleeding into your abdominal cavity can, of course, irritate your peritoneum. Irritating the peritoneum can exacerbate your severe lower abdominal pain. It can also cause shoulder pain um, when you uh, bleed into the peritoneal space, you can have pain referred upwards to the shoulder. And if you specifically irritate the phrenic nerve, that can actually cause hiccups in your patient. So that might be a sign of ectopic pregnancy that has ruptured. Bleeding into the abdominal cavity, as I alluded to earlier, can lead to hemorrhagic shock if you're bleeding um, in severe quantities. So you can end up with the symptoms of hemorrhagic shock as well. This includes tachycardia, hypotension, and syncope. And there's actually a strange process where if, they, if the patient bleeds so much, if they have hemorrhagic shock following ectopic pregnancy so much, the tachycardia turns into bradycardia. And we're not exactly sure why that happens. So I didn't listen on this slide, but it is possible that in a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, the patient starts with tachycardia as they have hemorrhagic shock that later turns into bradycardia. One last note on imaging. The best initial test for imaging for ectopic pregnancy is the transvaginal ultrasound. And the key defining characteristic is despite all these symptoms, despite all these clinical signs, despite a high beta HCG on your urine or serum test, the patient has an empty uterine cavity. And depending on where the ectopic pregnancy is, you might be able to see the embryo in an ectopic site, such as in the fallopian tubes. So start with the transvaginal ultrasound when you're going for imaging for ectopic pregnancy. This has been a short flowchart of ectopic pregnancy. I hope it was helpful, and thank you for listening.